Hi, I'm Doby. Consider this sort of an intro to the channel itself. The reason why I'm making this in the first place is I've always wanted to be a filmmaker. As I go along, I'll be teaching you, the viewer, everything that I learned along the way. So if you're anything like me and you never went to film school and you're learning yourself, consider this us learning together. Sort of like schoolmates, except for I'm not gonna ditch you after graduation. Kyle. I mean it when I say that I've always wanted to be a filmmaker though. I remember when I was 10 years old and I picked up my dad's VHS camcorder and used to make home movies with it. The first thing I made was a stop motion film called uh, Jurassic Park 3. Yeah, I know what you're thinking though. Could have done a better job. Alan. So you must be thinking by now, wow, this guy's probably got years of experience. He must be so good. Truth is, since I was 10, I've pretty much only kind of accomplished like a couple of music videos, a wedding video, BTS stuff, and just a lot of camera tests. But for years, what I have been doing is buying film gear, playing with that film gear, honing my craft and watching YouTube channels on how to, buying my time and prepping myself for the one day that somebody would choose me to help them make a movie. Or as my mum would say, a male pick-me girl. But all that changed back in the late summer of 2022 when I met a local filmmaker who chose me to be his DP on a short film he was making. Before this, I had never worked on a single film set. I had never worked with actors or crew or anything. But in some weird way, I felt like I'd been preparing for this moment for years. But getting thrown into it so suddenly ended up teaching me a lot of valuable lessons. So today I want to teach you some things that I learned on my first film shoot, and hopefully these things will preemptively prepare you for your first film shoot. Here are five lessons that I learned on my first film. Number one, get in shape. I'll admit this one sounds a little bit strange. You wouldn't expect filmmaking to be the sort of thing where you'd need the physique of the Giga Chad meme. Then again, let's look at me. Ooh, literal machop phenotype. <laughs> but the truth is, is on a shoot and wherever that might take you, you're gonna have to be able to take your gear along with you as well, and most likely nobody's gonna help you along with that, especially if you're working with a small crew. It's just a rule of thumb, but actors should never be carrying anything, so never expect the actors to be carrying anything. Their safety is way more prioritized than yours. When I showed up to my first shoot, I looked like a literal bellboy. I had a film gear backpack, two camera bags, an umbrella, fully rigged shoulder camera, and a water canteen. All that gear must have been an additional 50 to 60 pounds hanging off of my arms and back. And worse yet, this shoot would not only require me to carry this everywhere for 24 hours straight, but I had to hike up and down a mountain with it too. Having good back strength, leg strength, and good cardio is kind of a must. Because whether it's a documentary or a narrative piece, a film could take you basically anywhere, and not every single film is shot on a comfy studio lot or temperature-controlled set, especially on a low to no budget film. The best workouts I've found for this is just a lot of arm lifts, skipping rope for cardio, and straight up walking or hiking. For years, if I ever went out to go do photography, I'd basically load myself up with as much gear as possible, weigh myself down, and then hike for probably half a day with that sort of stuff. It was good prep work for this kind of stuff that would later pay off. And trust me, it would pay off, because at the end of the shoot, after the 48 hours, my legs were destroyed, but it would have been so much worse if I had not been prepping myself for so long. Also, stretching is a must. If you can do anything in your power to preserve your back or your back muscles with proper lifting, you need to do that. Whether you're a gaffer who is always reaching up high and holding heavy lights, or a DOP always shouldering a camera rig, or a boom mic operator with his arms constantly up in the air, you want to make sure that you're in enough shape to be able to do all this without actually destroying your body in the process. Although there is one thing that's more important than getting in shape. Number two, dress for the situation slash weather. This isn't just about what you're wearing for that day. This is kind of about preemptively preparing yourself for what kind of weather you're going to be facing, especially if you're out there in the wild. Looking up forecasts and weather reports the day previously and getting yourself the appropriate clothing for that day as well is kind of something that's going to be on your priority list. The shoot that we were on actually ended up having us blasted with three different types of weather. It started off with cold overcast, then it went to pouring rain on the slippery side of a mountain, and then it went to sunny and bright and way too hot. The entire cast was getting whiplash from Mother Nature's mood swings. 
So naturally as a result, I needed clothing that was going to protect not only me, but also my gear. I ended up bringing with me winter boots, a pair of pants, a pair of shorts, an all-weather waterproof hat called a Tilly, a shirt and a hoodie, an umbrella, and a foldable rainproof poncho. Admittedly, I looked a little silly wearing a hoodie, an Aussie hat, shorts, and winter boots, but then again, I'm behind the camera, so what you're wearing really doesn't matter because you're behind the camera. Although it does matter if you're wearing anything that's too bright or loud. Usually the proper etiquette for clothing when you're the crew is to wear something black or at least dark because I don't think that the gaffer or the DOP is going to appreciate your hot pink sweater bouncing off of the actor's face. No joke, the hat, the poncho, and the boots ended up being what saved me in my gear especially. But crazy enough, I actually ended up wearing everything that I brought. Honestly, I think I just kind of lucked out with the shoot and bringing extra stuff with me. Which goes to my next point. Number three, bring extra gear. In terms of camera gear, I wish I had Mary Poppins nanny bag so I could just fit everything I own into this lightweight one bag. But unfortunately, that doesn't exist. It doesn't seem like Biden has any interest in making one, so <laughs> scratch that. I made sure to take enough gear that I could realistically carry it all without hurting myself or becoming a liability. That's the balance that you'll strike when you're rushing to a set without the aid of a uh, crew or any kind of gear transportation. You'll end up weighing what's most important to you gear-wise when you do this, and it actually, no joke, made me reevaluate what was most important to me in terms of gears and what was necessary and what was overkill. It was a real Sophie's Choice moment when it came to evaluating my gear like that. It's way more tragic though. Since I was the only person bringing gear to the set, I opted for a one camera, one lens setup. I shot with my GH5, which I'm shooting with right now. In terms of my lens, I went with this little guy. It's great, he's super compact. It's my Sigma 30mm art lens. You can actually get tight enough to do portraits with this thing, but when you pull back, you can get the actors in a great medium shot and still get the background and focus and everything too. It's a pretty great all-rounder and I highly recommend this. One of the things I ended up not bringing with me and I dearly missed it was a 5-in-1 reflector and since we were shooting outside it would have really come in clutch. I was sadly in a rush and just kind of forgot to pack it and it's kind of stupid because it's super flat, lightweight, it folds up and the thing is, is that it's super versatile. Thinking back on it now, I think that a 5-in-1 reflector is an absolutely essential item that you should bring on every shoot no matter what and is a just in case. But before we go with the fourth tip, a quick word from our sponsors. Can you believe it? It's you! That's right, if you're supporting over at Patreon.com, you're directly funding the next project and are helping me support this channel. And if you donate to my PayPal, all proceeds go towards a new film that I'm- a self-funded film that I'm making. The film is titled Unheimlich. It's a short horror film. It's about a woman with a struggling relationship who moves into a new apartment with the hopes of a brighter future for herself and her boyfriend, but soon discovers how lonely and unsettling a new home can truly be. Ooh. Here's also a photo of the concept. So, so if you donate to either the Patreon or the PayPal, you're directly funding that. It's a, it's a unionized project, got two actors already signed on, got some crew. I just want to make sure everybody gets paid. I don't see a penny out of this. It's all going towards the cast and crew, and whatever's left over goes to, like, Crafty. So, just keep that in mind. I'll be doing my first film that's coming out pretty soon. I'm gonna make sure to do a lot of BTS work on that as well. So it'll probably take like a solid month before it's actually finished. So expect this film to be actually finished and on the channel by like somewhere in spring, maybe summer. Again, thank you for donating. Thank you for subscribing, all of that. Thank you for supporting this channel so far. This is a new channel and it's small, and, but if we can get ourselves to a thousand subscribers and a certain amount of watch time, we can actually start monetizing this content. I mean, they're already throwing ads on my videos right now, but I'm just not making any money off of it. So it'd be cool. I mean, we're more than halfway. We're already sitting at almost 600 of the making of this video. 600 subs. Just sub, tell your friends. In the meantime, if you want to help out the channel for free, every like, every comment, every share, and subscription really helps the channel. And if you comment down below, I will see you there. Okay, back to the video. Number four, audio over video. As a cinematographer, I hate to admit this, but audio is more important than cinematography. It's just a fact. It's one of those truths of life. And I hate to just blatantly steal from another filmmaker slash YouTuber, 
but I think that David F. Sandberg said it best in his video where he's talking about movie making tips. I'll just play the clip. He kind of says it best. Here's a little test. I'm going to show you a clip in two different ways. One with really shitty video and one with really shitty audio. Now imagine that you have to watch a whole film that's in one of these two ways. What would you choose? Make sure you make him feel at home. They seem nice, but don't buy it. It gets real Game of Thrones around here. Make sure you make him feel at home. They seem nice, but don't buy it. So if that teaches you anything, you should know that going into a shoot that your audio needs to be top notch. Honestly, you could have a low end camera, but if you have really high end audio gear, you've got a way better chance at making a movie and a good movie that people will enjoy. If you don't believe me, just listen to this. Tangerine from 2015 proved that you can have a solid narrative shot on an iPhone. 2002's 28 Days Later used a DV camcorder to film its movie. It's still one of the scariest films ever made. In fact, one of my personal favorite films ever made, 2013's Upstream Color, was shot on a Panasonic Lumix GH2. That's a camera that's literally three generations older than the camera that's filming me right now. It's very impressive, and honestly, the film looks stunning. And what's better yet is the sound quality is amazing. The director of Upstream Color, Shane Crew, did the same for his directorial debut, Primer, from 2004. It was shot on 16mm, but almost all of the film and dialogue was re-recorded or ADR'd in post to get the most clear sound you could for the film. Say what you want about these directors or their films, but they had the right idea when they favored audio over visuals. It's like I said. It's just a fact. So that brings me to the point of what I learned while I was on set when it came to audio. The thing is that when I was hired on, I was hired on as a wet hire. If you don't know what a wet hire is, it's essentially if you're sort of the DOP or cinematographer for a shoot, you bring all of your own gear, everything. You're sort of like the DOP in the rental shop together. So with that in mind, I kind of had to pack everything myself and I was in charge of everything that was on set. And the set itself only had six of us. So there was the director, the two lead actors, our makeup artist, our behind the scenes photographer, and then me. If you know anything about filmmaking, you'll realize that there's somebody missing from the picture. It's a sound technician. So that meant audio fell onto my shoulders as well. That's kind of one of the many hats that you'll wear in a small production. You kind of have to be a little bit of everything in a way. The only audio gear that I had on hand was a Rode Video Micro, which was mounted to the camera, and two Rode Lavalier mics. Sadly on that shoot, we were missing a boom mic or a shotgun mic, which would have been nice to have. In fact, actually after the shoot, I realized how important those things are. So to sort of celebrate and treat myself, I ended up buying one. When we shot that day, we kind of made do with what we had on hand, but I'm really glad I brought those two lavalier mics because they came in clutch. In fact, they ended up saving the film itself. One shot, which was a solid one minute wonder, had the actors walking through the woods far away from camera, and there's no way that we could have captured their dialogue even if we had brought a boom mic. Those two lab mics were the difference between whether or not we had a film to show or nothing to show at all. The craziest part, and this is true, was the night before the shoot, I had, there was a 6 a.m. wake up call and I had been packing all night, I think well into like maybe 2 a.m. in the morning till I passed out. I woke up to a phone call from the director and he was right outside of my house. Right before I left, I realized I was missing one of the two lavalier mics. I ended up calling him back and I said, hey, wait 10 minutes, hold on, I'm missing something. And I tore my room apart looking for that last lav because that extra 10 minutes that I took to look for that lav, we ended up being too late for the first early ferry out to Victoria Island. But if I hadn't gotten that second lav, it would have ruined the entire production. And that's the power of audio and filmmaking. Number five, push for more takes. Take your time. Now the last thing that I learned on set is to push for as many takes as you can. What I mean by that is if you're shooting with an actor and you feel like you've gotten the strongest take that you can out of them, push for an extra take. Maybe allow your actor to sort of freeform the character a bit, try different things. Who knows, kind of fill it out because they're an actor, it's their job. And frankly, you don't own a crystal ball. You don't know if you actually got their strongest take yet. Sometimes maybe it might be right around the corner and you just haven't captured it yet. This idea of taking your time comes from the idea that movies should never be made quickly. 
You hear people brag about their micro-budget film, but nobody ever brags about how quickly they wrapped on a project. Everyone who makes movies knows that time is the greatest currency in filmmaking. It's just that when it comes to big budget films, the studios don't usually really care and they try to cut corners and pinch pennies. It's sort of where you get that conveyor belt method of filmmaking. I mean, just look at any Marvel movie. These things are mostly made in post and even then the VFX aren't given enough time to bake in the oven and they end up looking like... Stop crying, it won't do any good. And anyway, you have a lot of work to do, starting right now. On shoot day, we were in a massive rush. It was a 6 a.m. wake up, which we were late for, because of me. We had to make the earliest ferry, which we missed, because of me. The second we landed in Victoria, we Ubered over to Bear Mountain. And then, as we got there, we had to climb up Bear Mountain and shoot as we were going up the mountain. Needless to say, it was a lot. And we were really stretched for time. But for every scene that we shot, we made sure to take our time. We made sure to get the best take that we could. That wonder that I talked about earlier, it ended up actually taking six tries to complete. Six takes is nothing. In fact, the only reason it took six takes, because the actors had it in three, they were perfectly fine. The additional three was actually me. It's because I had to sort of navigate and pull focus and walk backwards and do all this sort of stuff. Our BTS photographer on shoot actually had to put his hand on the back of my back and sort of guide me in case of there was like a rock or a stump or something and it was a whole coordinated piece in fact I was mostly directing it myself because the director had to go do other things at the time but we got it we shot for coverage we got pretty much every shot that we needed at least in the limited time that we had the alternative could have been worse another thing I learned is that you don't have to beat down your actors in order to get a good take. Your actors are artists. They really are, and they usually do care about their projects that they work on. And their whole goal is to make a good movie just as much as you. So beating them down doesn't make any sort of sense. Just communicating to them properly seems to be the trick. So essentially, work with your actor, not against them. In fact, this idea of not rushing on set kind of brings up a famous quote from my favorite director, Stanley Kubrick. When they wrapped production on Full Metal Jacket, the actor who played Cowboy went up to Stanley Kubrick to shake his hand and thank him. Stanley turned and said, You know, you're gonna miss me. When you're working on a set and the director calls cut, we got it, let's move on and you're gonna know that you don't have it. You're gonna miss me, because you know I would have never said cut and then say let's move on, unless I have it, and you're gonna miss me. And the crazy part was he was right. The actor went on to do other projects and he said the first thing that he worked on, that exact same thing happened. You can say a lot of things about Stanley Kubrick, but he was passionate about filmmaking. I mean, you have to if you're like, any of these top directors. The fact that the actor went on to different sets and they had this lack of love, lack of care, lack of effort is kind of depressing. I swear that that sort of mentality bleeds into every aspect of a film. If you're shooting a film to do it as quickly and efficiently as possible and you're making it incredibly conveyor belt and robotic, that mentality bleeds into every other aspect of the filmmaking. It bleeds into the actors, it bleeds into the production, and it bleeds out into the audience when they're watching it. People can tell when something's made without love or passion. So don't do it for coverage, do it for love of the filmmaking. And trust me, as an editor, there is no amount of editing or post-production that can fix lack of passion. So that's it. That's uh, my lessons to you as a starting filmmaker and what to be prepared for when you get on set. But just in case, do you think that there's anything that I missed here? Do you think that there's any other tips that you might be able to add? And if you have worked on a set, tell me your stories down in the comments below. Also, I want to pose a question to you guys. If you do own gear, what's a piece of gear outside of a camera in the lens that you can't live without? And it can't be attached to the camera rig. What is like your one essential gear that you have to have on set? So leave your comments down below and I'll probably see you down there because I like replying to comments mostly. So welcome to the channel again. My name is Dobie and uh, I'll be seeing you around the bend. Until then.